Hello, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for attending our seminar this morning. Okay, so first of all, and before we start, I would like to thank uh, U.S. Cliver for inviting me to serve as a guest editor for this uh, special edition of the U.S. Cliver Variation news Newsletter. It has been a great pleasure and great honor working with this amazing group. Uh, and so, uh, diving right into it, it, it's likely not news for most of the audience today that the U.S. East Coast is highly vulnerable to the effects of sea level rise and change. Uh, in many locations uh, along the East Coast, the rates of sea level rise far exceed the global average. And on top of those long-term trends, uh, accelerated changes in sea level from one year to the next make some of these locations even more vulnerable, given that sea level is now uh, closer and closer from reaching the floating thresholds. And any anomalous drivers, such as strong winds and changes in ocean dy dynamics, can further uh, help push uh, these sea levels beyond the, the flooding thresholds and initiate flooding in these locations. Uh, many impacts are already being seen uh, in highly developed urban centers such as New York City, Miami, and many others. And the impact in these locations are so visible that there is already a sense of awareness among the general public and, and coastal stakeholders. And as a matter of fact, uh, for us in, in some of these locations, it's not uncommon at all for us to hear uh, about the upcoming King Tide forecast along with the weather forecast uh, in our favorite broadcasting channel. And with that awareness, uh, there's also the recognition that strategic action must be taken immediately in order to start mitigating uh, current and future impacts. Uh, and, uh, one of the key challenges when we talk about sea level rise and adaptation, and apart from the elevated costs of implementing this uh, new protective infrastructure, uh, that is that sea level is inherently a multidisciplinary topic that involves professional with professionals with very distinct backgrounds. And so cross communication and efficient exchange of information between these different parts is, is one of the key challenge but also is a key need um, moving forward. And so to specifically address this need, uh, we have organized and hosted a workshop last year that's aimed at fostering this exchange of information between sea level scientists, practitioners, and stakeholders. And uh, for most of us, uh, this was, the workshop was an amazing learning experience and also allowed us to learn more about some of the forefront work that is ongoing in these different areas. And so in this uh, special issue of the U.S. Cliver Variations newsletter, we had a, a, a unique opportunity to further highlight some of these remarkable examples of the science, observing technologies, and adaptation efforts uh, that are ongoing um, along the U.S. East Coast, as well as on how science information is being translated into decision making. And so uh, this, feature, this um, issue featured these uh, following articles, which you will hear more about in today's webinar. And uh, before we start uh, with the presentations, I wanted to uh, extend my deep gratitude for the leading authors for accepting our invitation to contribute, uh, which uh, thanks to your contribution, this will become a valuable resource uh, for the community. And so with that said, uh, let's get right uh, into it. And so it is my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, um, Jayanta Obey-Sequeira, who is kindly known as Obey, and uh, who is the director of the Sea Level Solution Centers with the Florida International University. And he will talk about how our decision, sci how our decision science methods uh, helping design and implement coastal sea level adaptation projects. So Obey, you're up. <laughs> So I want to thank uh, Ricardo uh, and, and Jeannie for organizing this and inviting me to write the paper and, and also U.S. Clive for, 
providing this opportunity to highlight the sea level rise adaptation in our region. I want to acknowledge my co-authors, um, Myline Hasnut from Delta RS Netherlands and Robert Lampert from Rand Corporation. Um, so I'll be presenting a summary of what was in the article. Um, very briefly about sea level rise, uh, we all know that um, you know there are um, global factors which are like um, you know ice melt from the land-based ice sheets. Uh, for example, uh, land water storage uh, uh, coming into the ocean and also the thermal expansion. So these are the primary drivers. And then there are uh, for regional level, we have other factors, um, you know, vertical land movement, the ocean dynamics like the um, Gulf Stream uh, in our area, and also the gravitational effects as the ice melts. And I've worked on this uh, for a couple of uh, national level reports. And more and more, um, the scientists are recognizing that there is a, a quite a lot of uncertainty in the response of the polar ice sheets and the ice models are not perfect yet. And it is an area of ambiguity or call, what we call deep uncertainty. Uh, and, and if you want to look at, um, see a, a formal definition of deep uncertainty, it's a situation where models basically cannot agree on the key forces that shape the future or even the probability distribution of key variables and parameters. So they are kind of beyond the uh, these traditional source of, uh, sources of uncertainty. So the key question is, how do you plan for adaptation in this type of setting of deep uncertainty? Um, I just want to mention that there is a, uh, this topic of uh, decision making under deep uncertainty is of, um, you know, quite a lot of, uh, is of interest to many people around the globe. Um, there is a, even a Society for Decision Making Under Deep Uncertainty, DMDU, and there is a book. And as last I saw, this book is actually free. You can download that. And there are three uh, methods I want to highlight of applying decision making under deep uncertainty for this adaptation planning under sea level rise or in general climate change. Uh, those are dec robust decision making or RBM, Pioneer primarily by RAND Corporation, then the decision scaling or what is known as bottom-up approach, um, pioneered by uh, Casey Brown and others. The one I'm going to highlight today, which I like very much, is called Dynamic Adaptive Policy Pathways, or DAP in short, and, and developed by primarily by the, the Dutch in the Netherlands and being applied everywhere now. <clears throat> so what is DAP? Basically, the decisions are made over time in a dynamic interaction with the environment. In other words, you cannot look at the system, but cannot be, uh, you know, considered independently um, in relation to the dynamic interaction. So there are a couple of key highlights of this approach. It explicitly accounts for the decision making over time, which is very useful, particularly under conditions of deep uncertainty. The second aspect is that the design, it designs a dynamic adaptive plans, uh, considering both short term and long term, and, and more importantly, adaptation signals and tipping point. And I like this phrase, uh, what we call different roads leading to Rome, and basically, that is, those are the pathways to get to your endpoint. So this is a, a, what we call a metro map to illustrate this methodology. And basically you have several actions, action A, B, C, and D, and then you have a current situation underneath. You basically have the, uh, the driver in our case, let's say sea level rise scenario. You have multiple scenarios due to uncertainty um, that we discussed earlier. And then, you know, action A is is basically large enough or comprehensive that it might last you through the whole hundred years, for example, under different scenarios. Action D is the same, and then action B has an endpoint and basically a tipping point or what we call a sell by date. In other words, after that point, because of the change in conditions, in this case sea level rise, after some years it will stop working. So the key idea is. We, how do we switch to another pathway at that point 
basically uh, these transfer stations or you know going into another pathway and defining another pathway up front and and similarly for other actions at certain other times in the future you may have to go to a different pathways and then there are these uh, triangles you see in here uh, basically those are what we call adaptation signals in other words we are watching the data and we see there's an adaptation signal and then we have a decision node and typically it takes time to plan these things so the key concept here is like you plan this out through the entire time frame into the into your planning horizon and then you put together this um, this matrix of what are the different pathways what are the costs what are the benefits for various time frames so this is known as a metro map like a metro uh, rail system in a big city with uh, transfer stations and uh, and different pathways so so I'm going to go into the South Florida situation. I'm not going to go into detail. I, these pictures are showing what is actually happening on the ground, flooding the airport and Key West having floods, uh, tidal floods for 60 days, so what intrusion and others. So the key question is, you know, in a, in a setting like this, how do you plan under questions of deep uncertainty? So I'm going to talk about this case study of Little River Basin in Miami. Uh, you see on the left-hand side, there's a little basin called C7 or Little River Basin. This is subject to a lot of flooding due to sea level rise, local rainfall, and rising groundwater levels. So in this approach we, we use, we basically had um, a lot of stakeholder meeting. Basically, this is an idea of co-production, work together with them to develop these pathway maps, uh, sketch these out, what are the things that we could be using up at what time. Basically, this is what we call a portfolio of measures. So in this particular study, we had several uh, measures in the, in the pathways or solutions or adaptation options for, for uh, mesh, as measures. So what we call M0, it's a no action scenario. M1 is, you know, what are the measures we can use to, to prevent flooding in neighborhoods? And those are like local uh, pumps, flood walls, gates, and local pumps, basically, or, or what we call infiltration trenches in Miami. And then finally, M2 and M3. M2 is like a, uh, for the major canal that is charging into the ocean, we would recommend increasing the size of the big pump station. So that will provide the the uh, the protection for the interior area and finally the ultimate solution might be to raise roads and buildings up to a certain point to have the level of protection that you need so the question is how do you face these solutions in at what point what do you watch for so what we did was we did um, we looked at different drivers of sea level rise precipitation storm surge ran a hydraulic hydrologic routing model and uh, we used the Delft fiat or the uh, the damage assessment model developed by the um, by the dutch and finally we laid out the pathways you basically up on the figure here you basically the ex look at the expected annual damage for this black line representing m0 the m1 or the green line uh, representing the uh, the local flood mitigation and the bottom uh, graphic showing the M3 option. So the idea here was at what point particular solution might um, not, not work or what we call a tipping point or sell by date uh, point. So in our case, the criteria was can we keep the same expected annual damage as the current condition to switch to another pathway? So you see uh, one pathway here by 2055 and another pathway uh, for the high sea level rise scenario, you know, also on 2050. And then you lay out the pathways. In this case, we laid out, okay, what are our different um, portfolio solutions? regional flood mitigation, various option local mitigation, and basically the race in the roads and, and, um, and building. So the idea here is like you get a complete picture of what could be the overall solution in the long run for different sea level rise scenarios. So in summary, I know, I know we have a short time. Um, 
basically the idea is the pathways are open de open decision spaces identify dependencies between pathways and overcome what we call policy paralysis uh, we also identify tipping points under what condition and when to act we also um, emphasize monitoring and detect signals when adjustments are necessary and in this in this case we actually use model based expert opinion and and what we call co-production of participatory pathways and that's it uh, for me for a 10 minute short talk on that and i encourage you to read the article and send me an email if you have any questions thank you ricardo thank you, thank you very much obey very nice talk so i'm just going uh so we have 5 minutes for questions Right. See, so Shane has a question. Uh, he asks, is this uh, specific case study openly available? Uh, yes, we do have a report. Um, you know, we are writing a journal article on that, but we, I'll be happy to send um, the report that was produced as a part of the project. Um, I think you have my email on the article, or maybe Jenny can share that. Uh, if you send me an email, I can send that report to you. I can share your email with Shane. Yeah. Any other questions? I, I think so we should. I, I do. Oh, do you I, have a I just want. To, yeah, I just wanted to have uh, uh, one question. Quick question for a bit. I assume uh, this similar approach is is being applied to other regions here in Miami, and uh, so I wonder how much. A specific pathway can be uh, used in in slightly different regions, uh, and does it need, really comes down to the local? Uh, characteristics? Yeah, yeah. I think you're raising a good point, Ricardo. Obviously, the the solutions will be different. For example, if you're talking about outside Florida. Uh, but the general concepts are the same. This method has been applied in 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 UK, uh, in the um, you know New Zealand and 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 some places in Asia. But I think in Florida, uh, these are specific to Florida. But it could be even different within the state of Florida. In some places, maybe the groundwater is not a big topic. But generally, the concept that we use lays out the general pathway in our region in the long run, uh, depending on the sea level rise, maybe basically what I call vertical uh, retreat might be the option, racing the roads and, uh, and, and um, you know, houses. But in other places, it might not be the case. But you basically have a portfolio of measures or solutions, uh, route, you know, for that particular region, but the approach is the same. And you might use different metrics for your selection as well. We use expected annual damage. Okay. Thank you very much, Obey. Thank you. I have one question from Mike Sukup. Uh, he asks, some pathways seem to die out. Is that right? Yeah, there's some pathways that that is what we call the tipping point. In other words, that particular solution uh, is not working anymore. It's like a sell by date, as they call it. Uh, it's a tipping point, so it's not working. And that is basically the if that's what you're asking, Mike. Uh, you know, dying out. That means that solution doesn't work anymore. So you need to go to a different pathway at that point. Thank you very much, Obi. Thank you. Uh, so our next speaker uh, is Jake Leash, uh, who is with the Palm Beach County uh, in South Florida and is presenting on behalf of uh, Lauren Ardway. And the title of their talk and article is uh, Designing the Resilient Coastal Communities of the Future, a Southeast Florida case study. Uh, thank you, Ricardo. Can you hear me? See everything okay? Yes, everything's good. Excellent. I'd like to thank uh, US Clive for inviting me along to this, as well as uh, Jenny and Ricardo for helping set this up. Um, my name is Jake Leach. I'm with Palm Beach County's Office of Resilience down here in Florida. Uh, and today I'm going to be speaking a little bit about our regional climate compact and some of the work that we're doing locally on climate change, uh, including sea level rise. So as you 
possibly heard, global climate is changing. Um, that change is generating different consequences in different parts of the world. Uh, here in South Florida, we're sort of a low-lying coastal subtropical part of the world. So we've got um, sort of very specific consequences to deal with. Um, a big one is hurricanes and extreme storms that we have to contend with. Um, so I know there isn't a, a really established link between global warming and hurricane frequency, um, but we have just had a record setting 30 named storms in the Atlantic this season. Um, so hurricanes are definitely on people's mind. Um, we do think that they're changing, uh, getting stronger, getting possibly wetter, some other changes that are occurring. And of course, with sea level rise, uh, the storm surges that are associated with those storms are, are also becoming more consequential. Um, we experience extreme heat. Uh, that can be a big deal down here. Um, construction, tourism, agriculture are all very large parts of our uh, economy down here. Um, so obviously, uh, extreme heat can have um, a big impact on that. Um, we also have a lot of issues with coastal erosion, uh, losing our beaches, which again is a big economic problem for us. Um, and we experience tidal as well as inland flooding, especially during our king tides, uh, which are the highest high tides of the year. I think Ricardo mentioned them earlier. Uh, they tend to occur this time of year, sort of September, October, November. So in late 2009, four counties in Southeast Florida realized that a lot of these threats were imminent in South Florida. Um, these aren't some sort of distant concern that's looming somewhere out in, in the year 2100. This is something that's happening now. Um, we we realized that this was going to be a problem that was going to uh, present sort of similar threats across the area, that this wasn't going to be uh, kind of localized to specific municipalities or counties. Um, and thirdly, we also realized that uh, the response was going to need sort of a coordinated effort by a lot of local stakeholders and jurisdictions all kind of working together. And implicit in that that third assumption was the idea that we might actually be on our own, that we we weren't really going to expect too much action on the federal or state level. Right. This is during the, the infamous Rick Scott uh, ban on climate change sort of era. Um, so we started this 10 years ago. And just as an aside, I think one of the big points of pride for the Southeast Florida Regional Climate Change Compact is the number of similar arrangements that have popped up across the state and across the nation uh, since our inception. Um, it's kind of tough to keep track of these other compacts. Um, sometimes they're not as successful as they could be. Um, they're kind of difficult to define and they, they work in different ways, so they're difficult to count. Um, but there are plenty of them popping up. And we like to think that we were maybe the inspiration for a few of these. So anyway, what have we been doing in this last decade? One of our most impactful products, and I think one of sort of the crown jewels of the compact has been our local sea level rise projections. Um, the first one of these was completed in 2012. It was updated in 2015 and then again last year. Um, to produce these projections, we gathered together representatives from the compact counties um, and I got to represent Palm Beach County on this during the 2019 update, so I really got to see how this sausage gets made. Um, we also gathered together scientists from local universities. Uh, you know, Obi and Ricardo from uh, FIU and University of Miami were both involved in this. Um, we have federal agencies involved, like NOAA and Department of the Interior, and other stakeholders. Uh, City of Fort Lauderdale was involved, Nature Conservancy, um, the South Florida Water Management District. So it's a very broad, well-informed group. Um, we sit down, we work together to decide on what the most reasonable set of sea level rise projections from nationally and globally recognized groups that can provide local projections tied to individual tide gates or grid squares are. Um, obviously, it can get a little contentious at times, but at the end of the day, we put together a consensus product um, and I think we're all pretty happy with it. So when we put this together, we have two main audiences. The first is obviously planners and developers who need to know about raising sea levels in order to determine if or how they should be building in given areas, right? Um, and including that group is Palm Beach County. Uh, so we're currently in the process of formally incorporating consideration of these projections into planning and development of county capital projects. Um, and I've added a couple of highlights to the, uh, to the official chart here so you can see how it works. So if you have non-critical or short lifetime projects, uh, like a parking lot or a park or something like that, 
uh, you should usually consider sea level rise between the IPCC median and the NOAA intermediate high projections. Uh, if you're looking at uh, critical infrastructure, uh, we usually use a nuclear power plant as an example, but perhaps not the best. Uh, perhaps you should think about a, a county emergency operations center or something like that, something that has to keep functioning no matter what, or something that has a very long design life, uh, like a bridge, for example. We think that for those, we should be using these these NOAA high projections. Less likely to occur, but but definitely more consequential if it does. The other group of folks that we kind of target for the audience for this are the people who are involved in outreach and education. Um, anytime you go to a public lecture on climate change in South Florida, you're going to see these projections in those slide decks. Um, so that's one of the reasons that we used the year 2000 mean sea level as the datum instead of one of the more engineering type datums. Uh, and it's also why we've put in this uh, NOAA extreme projection, which we wouldn't recommend for planning purposes because the uncertainty on it is so high. But we do want people to be aware that this is a uh, a possibility, even if it's a very outside possibility. The Compact also produces a regional climate action plan, which is updated every five years. Uh, the last update to this was in 2017, and we're going to start a revision for the 2022 version uh, in its upcoming years. The current plan consists of 142 items over 12 subject areas. And it covers all kinds of threats and, and all kinds of responses and all kinds of aspects of society. We've got things as diverse as preserving historical artifacts, um, infiltrating water and wastewater infrastructure, uh, integrating social vulnerability data into projects, which is something we're, we're really starting to look at here at the county and across the compact. Uh, we also try to provide implementation workshops each year so that we can sort of take areas that are included in this action plan uh, and kind of really dig down and focus on those and get some expert panels in on there. Um, this year, obviously, that's been a little problematic, but last year we had panels on uh, workshops on uh, vehicle electrification, uh, sustainable procurement, um, things like that. Um, Another product we have is the vulnerability assessment, um, which combines assessments of exposure to threats with the hardness and criticality of assets. Uh, so basically we say, what could possibly happen to this asset? If that happens, how badly will it damage the asset? And if the asset gets damaged or is non-functional, how big of a deal is that? Um, the problem with vulnerability assessments is that they are uh, very expensive. They're very difficult to complete. Um, deciding which hazards or exposures to include uh, can be complex. Um, you can be limited by budget. Grant sources might go to only sort of specific threats. Um, and as you can see, we've completed this vulnerability assessment, but it's from August 2012. Uh, so it is a little outdated. And also, it considers sea level rise, but that's really the only threat it considers. It doesn't consider any of the other sort of contingent threats or, or extra threats. On the other hand, we do have a lot of sort of smaller scale assessments that have been performed in the interim. Uh, so for example, in Palm Beach County, we've got a really great collaboration that's happening right now with seven of our southeastern municipalities. Um, we formed a regional coastal resilience partnership, and we're going to conduct a single sort of integrated vulnerability assessment across the southeast part of the county. Um, this vulnerability assessment assesses exposure to 12 different hazards, uh, a lot of which are, are sort of exacerbated by sea level rise. We've got things like storm surge, wildfire, uh, pest and disease outbreaks, drought, um, the study is also kind of novel because each threat that we're studying is, is going to be studied alongside socioeconomic data. So we're including that instead of just sticking with, I mean, most of these usually just sort of look at um, property values. Because uh, we really want to ensure that vulnerable populations are considered in an equitable manner when we're doing these studies. Uh, the downside is that it only covers sort of a small part of the county. Um, another example happening right now is the Army Corps of Engineers. They're conducting their South Atlantic Coastal Study. Um, that includes the four county compact area as one of the focus areas. Uh, but again, it, it only assesses a fairly small range of threats, and it only covers the uh, coastal or tidally influenced parts of the counties, which isn't ideal. So essentially, you know, we end up with a whole bunch of uh, sort of piecemeal studies that are looking at different threats, different areas. They're not always compatible. On the other hand, it, it kind of reflects the reality that that one size doesn't fit all, right? Not all municipalities and areas are going to need similar threats assessing. Uh, you know, coastal areas are going to need um, shoreline recession, perhaps studying. But if you're 20 miles inland, that might not be worth your time and effort. 
so if we're doing studies like this, we need data and we need modeling so that we can assess past and future conditions. Uh, I think we're all very proud of our sea level rise projections, um, but we're also in the process of updating a much more comprehensive set of climate indicators. Um, so we want to present to the public on our, on our website uh, a warehouse of data from several sources um, that's going to include county-specific historic and projected data, where it's available on temperature, heat index, precipitation, sea level rise, uh, high tide flooding, saltwater intrusion, SST. Um, we've got a simpler, less comprehensive version of this already on the on the compact website. But again, it's a little dated. It hasn't been updated since 2016. Um, we decided earlier this year that we were going to update those indicators, try to get back to them a little more regularly, uh, and also cut out some of the ones that are either not updated very often or sort of difficult to quantify or present. So for example, plant hardiness is, is not going to be included going forward. Um, just like with the sea level rise project, this project involved input from compact county staff members as well as scientists and technical experts. And again, Obi's been very uh, deeply in involved in this. Um, it, it's not as complete or sophisticated as the sea level rise projections. And a big reason for that is that we don't always have data that is detailed or um, projections that are as detailed. A, a really great example of that is precipitation. It's really difficult to project future local precipitation patterns in South Florida, um, either the shorter term events like storms or even longer term changes in annual amounts. So so something we're really desperate for here is, is better downscaled uh, model data and projection data if we could get it. Start wrapping up. Yep. Um, one of the other things that we're, we're very uh, keen on tracking is greenhouse gas inventorying. Again, we all kind of do it separately in kind of an ad hoc way, uh, but we all know what the, the sort of biggies in the region are. So we can put together a, a sort of regional um, uh, greenhouse gas inventory here. And as you can see, no surprises, uh, most of our greenhouse gas sources are transportation and uh, sort of grid electricity. And then finally, uh, another big piece of data that's hugely valuable for us is the return on investment for these uh, adaptations, right? If you want to make these decisions, you, you've got to know that if you're going to pay a very high upfront cost for a lot of this adaptation, that um, that you're going to get a return. Uh, the Compact just commissioned this study, um, the Business Case for Resilience through the Urban Land Institute that just came out in October. And yeah, we're happy to see that, that if we invest in adaptation, we are going to see economic and uh, benefits and job growth. And with that, I'd like to thank you all and take any questions. Thanks. I have a question, Jake. Um, this is Kim Cobb. Um, so, what, <laughs> okay. what kind of um, what kind of group or what kind of process uh, did you follow uh, to put together that business case report? Wow, we actually found that out to consultants. So, Urban Land Institute uh, sort of took our our mandate. At the compact level, we have a uh, economic resilience work group um, that I'm not actually in. Uh, they commissioned this study about a year ago. Uh, and again, we put out an, an RFS, we got a consultant in, uh, and they did most of the work for us. Sorry, that's not a particularly good answer. Thanks. <laughs> this is Donatella. I have also mm, a question for you, Jack. Uh, you talk about the social economic uh, uh, matrix, so, you know, the um, yeah, measurement of that uh, you estimated. Uh, can you give me uh, some examples? Um, I believe a lot of that's coming from sort of uh, publicly available um, sort of economic indicator uh, sort of census data. So I think we're looking at things like um, uh, how heat's impacting lower income communities, for example. Uh, I'm kind of quantifying those communities by looking at, you know, sort of standard indicators there, uh, income, language, age, things like that, education level. Uh, just one question, Jake. Uh, I'm curious whether the new unified projection is uh, already being incorporated in any ongoing projects in Palm Beach, and I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that. Sure. As I mentioned, we're in the process right now of putting together sort of a formal process and procedure manual, which is sort of how we, we formalize our processes here at the, at the county. Um, and we're going to require anybody who is making a capital investment any county department who's making a, a capital investment above a certain amount um, that they're going to have to incorporate those 
uh, curves into the planning and development, they're going to have to show which curve they've chosen, why they've chosen it, um, what's going to happen to the site that they're building at, and then tell us what they're doing to either adapt or mitigate potential future flooding. And that's, again, it's, it's going to be sort of an official formal part of county planning processes. Excellent. Thank you very much. All right, so uh, our next speaker uh, is uh, Donatella Pasqualini. She is with the Los Alamos National Laboratory, and uh, she will talk about uh, the challenges in predicting the coevolution of natural and human, human systems on coastal, coastal regions. Thank you very much, Donatella. So I would like to thank you, Ricardo, for uh, giving me this opportunity and for the wonderful and super efficient Gini to put everything together. And Joe Roland uh, is my co-author here, but actually what I'm presenting is uh, uh, the effort of uh, a larger team uh, at Los Alamos. So I'm a scientist at Los Alamos National Laboratory, and uh, um, as the title say, I will uh, focus, uh, I will talk about uh, briefly about what are the challenges in coastal regions uh, in terms of adaptation. And in particular, the um, scientific challenges that decision makers have been facing in trying to um, adapt to climate, uh, climatic changes, extreme events on coastal regions. So, a little background, the coastal regions are uh, the backbones uh, of uh, a nation economic, uh, our econo economy and uh, our security. There are uh, a home of uh, a high concentration of uh, population and uh, critical infrastructure, uh, such as electrical power and uh, water system. Systems that they've been uh, threatened by global changes and uh, extreme events. So sea level rise, uh, as we heard from the previous uh, talk, uh, storms, uh, even drought, uh, they've been uh, impacted very badly in you know, these uh, critical uh, regions. Public and private utilities, such as uh, electric power, utility of water utility, as well as a regional planner, have been trying to mitigate and adapt. We heard, you know, Jack talking about this, also the previous uh, uh, speaker. But um, there are still, uh, particularly in, in the uh, electrical power and the, the, in the critical infrastructure, electrical power and water, natural gas, uh, they've been not really uh, successful in uh, adapt, particularly. So one of the biggest limitation is uh, to the fact that they've been planning without accounting of the future changes and the complexity actually of how the cost lines evolves in the future. So just to give you an example, so the electrical power uh, utility in the Delaware Bay after the 2012, uh, 20, Yes, 2012 Sandy Hurricane have been uh, um, investing a lot of money, you know, billions uh, of dollars uh, to reinforce uh, the electrical power uh, substation that they are uh, critical assets in the electrical power network uh, that they were damaged uh, during uh, Sandy. The problem here is that uh, sea level rise uh, uh, will induce erosion. The erosion will uh, induce changes in the vegetation. There will be feedback in, of these changes in, in back into the geomorphology of the region, of the coastlines. So we cannot expect that the asset that Sandy damage in flooding or wind will be exactly the same in the future. Okay. So, um, so in order to um, really uh, be able to uh, planning uh, uh, an adaptation strategy here. We really need to be able to project the future evolution of the coastal zones. We need to be able to quantify the risk that this evolution poses to the infrastructure. And we need also to be able to plan for resilience with respect of the quantified risk. And we already heard in the first uh, 
uh, talk uh, was very important uh, how timing, uh, you know, and the time series of the season is very important. And this is also the point that I'm making. Okay. So just checking the time. And uh, so uh, why uh, the decision making do not uh, take this approach, uh, particularly in the utilities, uh, in the critical infrastructure? They are very aware of these changes and they know that the, these changes can produce uh, uh, impact in the future, different impacts in the future on their uh, system, on their critical infrastructure. The problem that, uh, you know, we are missing, they are missing, we are missing as a, a scientific uh, a community, uh, a tool or the science that can provide them a method to really estimate the risk that account for all this complexity of this evolution, or I should say co-evolution of the engineer, human and natural system uh, system in the of the coastal regions. Here we see, you know, I just show some erosion in the Delaware Bay. There are two acres of uh, um, erosion per year and the um, maps with all these dots are the critical infrastructure assets, uh, particularly electrical power and water um, treatment plant in this case uh, in uh, the Delaware. Just to give you a, you know, a feeling of uh, how much damage, uh, you know, and I mean, uh, what, are, what is the importance of the infrastructure in this region and how important it is to provide the decision makers with uh, a a tool that uh, can predict the future, the, you know, how, you know, they can help to uh, estimate, or, you know, adapt or plan how to adapt, or how to change the critical infrastructure uh, network. Next one, okay. So what we have been uh, developing uh, in, uh, at Los Alamos, and uh, actually, you know, right now is, uh, a multi uh, lab uh, effort is uh, to is focus to develop a larger framework that we here we call it nesma the new science for multi sector adaptation multi sector here stands for uh, you know not only the natural system but also the natural system integrated with the human and the engineering system for adaptation so um, we are uh, developing a science-based uh, framework uh, to understand uh, the coastal evolution, how this uh, evolution can be used to support uh, the coastal adaptation strategies. Uh, in the, the table, uh, uh, describe uh, the features uh, that uh, we think are critical uh, for this uh, framework. Uh, and the benefits that this feature can uh, uh, provide. So we need to have uh, high fidelity, integrated process-based uh, uh, natural system models. So the evolution of the coastal system needs to be uh, forecast or predicted at the scale that is important for the infrastructure. Okay, we need to have a high fidelity physics based infrastructure model to really plan how to make changes, redesign the electrical or the electrical power of the water, the critical infrastructure network in the regions. And what is important, we heard from Jack before, everything is to account for, of course, uncertainty. And it's not uncertainty, you know, it's not uncertainty only in the natural system or the engineer system. But you know, have a framework that allowed you to propagate all this uncertainty through this impact adaptation analysis. And the last is to provide a design optimization for risk management, an optimization, a, a, a adaptation plan that is defined or based on an optimization model. Okay, this is, uh, is um, um, a diagram of uh, uh, the main component of NESMA of this uh, infrastructure of this uh, framework for adaptation. You can see, you know, we start from the um, forcing that comes with a probability distribution, so with uncertainty. Um, 
and uh, land and vegetation ocean that uh, they need to be integrated to provide uh, what in this moment are the main uh, uh, hazards for the infrastructure that is salinity, surge erosion. These are, you know, this uncertainty propagates uh, through the system. Okay, so they are provided as uh, a distribution. Okay, and uh, I have just one minute. Okay, and that goes in our highly detailed infrastructure models to estimate the damage that is an input for our optimization. And uh, I think I still have one. Uh, yeah, okay, so I think that this, uh, I thought I have another, you know, but this is, uh, I think that was uh, the last. Uh, uh, slide that I have. So I saw that there are some questions. Yes, I need there to, is. Yeah, there I need a question to, from Obe. Yeah, I need to go back to. Uh, I'll the... read it. I can read it for you. So Obe oh, okay. is asking, how do you model the human systems and uncertainties in modeling multiple systems? Yeah, <laughs> that is a really good question. So in this case, uh, you know, we are focused uh, on uh, uh, the uncertainty on the infrastructure. Okay, so there are uh, there is the human component. Okay, so there are two types of uh, uncertainty actually uh, in uh, in the social economic component of this framework. That is uh, the evolution of the uh, demand of uh, energy. In particular, because we are focused actually in, in uh, electrical power, and in this case, uh, we thought we are using uh, right now. We have been using so far. We've been using the EAA uh, projection of uh, the demand, energy demand. Okay, and uh, uh, we are working now with uh, uh, Oakridge actually to um, incorporate a better uh, um, sort of urban uh, development uh, in order to quantify the demand of the energy, okay? And uh, the second part that has a lot of uncertainty comes from the cost. So we do adaptation and this uh, optimization that is based on the cost, okay? So that is actually where working with the stakeholders, with the utility, they provide us some estimation of, with an error bar of the data. So, uh, as you see, is mainly is uh, mainly an engineer system uncertainty that uh, you know we are considering. Okay, and how we propagate that? There are a lot of challenges, particularly because we are dealing with models, of, in particular in the natural system models, that it takes a very long time to be run. Okay, so what we did, we develop an emulator, a statistical emulator, that allowed us actually to generate a lot of ensembles of hazards and we run this ensemble through the to do a sensitivity analysis through you know the um, uh, infrastructure models any other questions for donatella So if if uh, just wait. So I do have a question, Donatella. Uh, I understand sure. that uh, the Los Alamos National Laboratory is the main user for this system, right? Uh, so my question is: Is this a framework or system? Are there any plans to make this available to the broader community so that they can modify and to their specific problems or or use or use something similar? Yes, so uh, that is uh, really the plan, and that is what we've been working uh, toward. So, um, is uh, so the idea is to, of course, we cannot. So there are different approaches that we are accounting to really com uh, convert this Nesma framework to a tool, operational tool. Okay, and for the utility, like the electrical power utility or the regional planners. So we've been talking with some of these uh, utility. So the idea is, uh, so first, uh, everything run on AWS. Most of them, the models run on AWS on the cloud. So they don't need uh, really to um, run our own models uh, on their own uh, computers. So they can access uh, 
the AWS is a government cloud in this moment, but we will open it. And uh, in the second part uh, is really the emulators. Even if um, we are able to allow the, you know, to the users, uh, the stakeholders, to use uh, these models, uh, they will not, uh, you know, have the time to, they will not, uh, you know, it takes too much time uh, really to run. We are running, we are using the E3SM, the Earth System uh, uh, models for, uh, you know, really to describe uh, the integration between vegetation, land and the ocean. That uh, really takes a lot of time to run it. So the emulator is the statistical emulator is something that actually we develop not only to do the sensitivity analysis, but also to convert this uh, science tool in a more operational and uh, uh, friendly, stakeholder friendly uh, tool. So these are the two main uh, approaches uh, features. Excellent, thank you. Okay, so uh, I think uh, we can go ahead and move on unless anyone else has uh, any other questions, I don't see. Okay, let's go ahead and move to our next speaker, uh, who is uh, King Cobb. She's with the Georgia Institute of Technology, and uh, she will talk about the smart sea level sensors for coastal climate resilience. Okay, can you guys see that? Yes, yes. Okay, fantastic. All right, so uh, thanks so much, Ricardo and uh, Jenny and US Clivar for uh, putting together this great newsletter, uh, consolidating some of the amazing work that's going on across the country in this in this field. And I'm so excited to hear more today from the experts who have laid such an amazing foundation for what I'm going to talk about uh, today. In particular, um, with the discussion uh, that Donatella just brought about the integrated modeling uh, but also OBI, thinking about uh, decision making under uncertainty. Every every uh, talk really has a uh, a lot to offer in terms of uh, really unveiling the complexity of of the challenge that we're up against in, in coastal communities. And um, this is a picture from coastal Georgia where we have a, a project uh, focused on um, uh, sea level sensors. Uh, really noting that uh, this is an area that floods very frequently from any number of different hazards that have already been enumerated, king tides, hurricanes, uh, wind events, et cetera. And so we'll be talking about uh, what we can do to think about short and long-term resilience in these kinds of communities. But first, I really wanted to acknowledge my co-authors and uh, partners in this project. Uh, Russ Clark from Computer Science at Georgia Tech is, is my uh, lead from Georgia Tech. And then rounding out our leadership team for this project, very importantly, are two people who are community level stakeholders. So Nick Defley from the Office of Sustainability in City of Savannah, as well as Randall Matthews from the uh, SEMA um, Chatham Emergency Management Agency, who have been with us from day one from project inception uh, through today, and uh, really happy to have their partnership. And you'll see how important it has been for us to have involved them from day one. And so this is from a National Weather Service just indicating the increasing frequency of floods, uh, both in terms of number and severity, of course, uh, has been already flagged by many different speakers today, so I'm not going to uh, dwell on this other than to say that 2020 looks anomalously low because they changed the definition of flooding levels <laughs> during 2020 for the Fort Pulaski tide gauge. So uh, don't be fooled. That would be a bar at 47 events if they had not changed uh, that bar. <laughs> so that's another trick here, Coastal Resilience. Just change your definition of, of absolute flood level. At any rate, we, we digress. So uh, next, I wanted to uh, talk about what is actually happening on the ground to these community members. Uh, this is a photo outside Russ Clark's house in Savannah, Georgia, where um, Thanksgiving Day a couple of years ago, uh, he looked out his window and, and the ocean is on his lawn. And this is you know, not predicted. This is the kind of thing that people wake up to on a regular basis. Um, this was a wind event, a northeasterly wind event uh, that, that came in for a matter of six hours and and really uh, created a patchwork, pretty complex patchwork of flooding across these communities. So it's not just the predicted king tides, which you can, emergency planners have really detailed plans to mitigate the damage from hurricanes, likewise, storm surge modeling and NOAA pushing alerts and National Weather Service. It's really events like this uh, that are becoming uh, really hazardous to residents. 
And so when we think about coastal resilience, this has already really been laid out so well. So I'm going to kind of share uh, some of the, the, the guideposts that we have used in designing our project. And so, uh, first of all, we've heard about the importance of science, of, of grounding a science based approach. But we've also understood that traditionally uh, the science of, of coastal hazards, of, of coastal risks, um, has really focused on developing a, a knowledge pool that one day may be deployed in service to solutions. But unfortunately, we are past the time where that is uh, that is no longer a luxury we can afford. So we have to design for a science to solutions framework that is an end to end approach from day one. And that's uh, something very, very different than scientists like myself have been trained to do uh, in our uh, ex expertise. And so we have to develop new toolkits there. And oh, and I say science is an asterisk there because this has to be uh, multidisciplinary. It can no longer be housed, as Donatella was saying, just in the physical sciences. We must explicitly include uh, scientists uh, from across the landscape, educational scientists, social scientists, city and regional planners, um, as well as, of course, our engineering colleagues. Um, and then also the second point is we need to think about the short term emergency planning application, which uh, keeps people safe, uh, hopefully today and tomorrow, but also thinks about providing consistent, completely consistent, internally consistent frameworks that leverage those tools, but apply them to longer term decision support um, under uh, limited resources and uh, important uh, kind of, as Jake was saying, uh, decision points that are um, are going to be made for the decades uh, of resilience building, hopefully. And then um, they also need to be multi sector. This is also not how traditional science has evolved. And so we have practitioner communities, we have boundary organizations, and we have the scientists. Um, we're going to need to erase all of those walls and think about forming teams from day one that are multi-sector in nature. So thinking about combining academic uh, municipal partners with NGO and private sector, uh, how do you build and maintain these teams uh, that are focused on uh, the development of shared goals? And then, of course, we need to think about grounding climate justice from day one. And this is a pretty a strong critique on, on how we have conducted uh, discussions around coastal resilience from a scientific perspective at any rate. Um, you know, we, we hope to design the best available tools and then hope that they're going to help those that are most in need. That's actually not the, necessarily the case. And so if you think about the communities that are frontline communities that are the most vulnerable communities, we know who they are. We know where they are. Uh, we may not know the full nature of their concerns or the full range of their needs. But this is why it's important to engage them from day one when we think about anything that uses the phrase coastal resilience. Uh, where is the climate justice focus at the core of that work? And so um, the last thing, of course, is you need this pattern of sustained and broad and deep uh, public engagement. And I would lift up that I think a focus on uh, integrating K through 12 education must be a core part of these climate resilience packages as well, because right now our approach to educating and training the next generation in this business is uh, is a day late, a dollar short, or actually a decade late and several billion dollars short. <laughs> so enter the smart sea level sensor project in Savannah and Chatham County. And so we've been working on this for about two years. And as you can see, it's a, a deep bench at Georgia Tech uh, for the most part. And then uh, our, our amazing colleagues down on the coastline. You can go check out our website, sealevelsensors.org. And it has a, a nexus of partnerships that is very, very broad and far ranging, ranging from federal level partners like the National Weather Service, who we collaborate closely with, to a local neighborhood organization like the Harambe House um, here, a uh, core in our community, uh, a local environmental justice organization that's focused on uh, advancing climate justice in the most underserved Savannah communities. So happy to call them uh, part of our core partner team, but you'll see a, a broad nexus of, of partners that we rely on to keep us focused on uh, shared goals and opportunities. And of course, uh, keep the conversation going around building resilience. This is the network as it stands in Savannah right now. We have about 50 sensors out there. I'll talk about the sensors in a minute. You can see them on the lower left is kind of a shoebox size with the ultrasonic uh, sensor technology poking out the end, uh, pinging the water level every six minutes uh, designed to mimic the frequency of, of the NOAA tide gauge network that we have along the coast. And so this is, of course, uh, we have Fort Pulaski, one tide gauge across the entire Georgia coastline. And here we have uh, 50 to date installed. 
And this is an example of our portal dashboard.sealevelsensors.org, where you can see the color coding changing depending on how high the water level is getting. And we have um, also a emergency planning portal I'll talk about in a minute. But this has been amazing to, to think about deploying and, and building out. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about where we are right now and what we hope to lift up in terms of core services as well. So the sensor itself is based on a $250 in, in really off the shelf parts. This is a photo of a student at Jenkins High School assembling one of 30 sensors in 2019 uh, as part of our project as part of their engineering curriculum. So speaking to that K through 12 piece, um, this has had the, the most resonance with our community stakeholders than anything else we have done. And so speaking to the importance of this point, when you think about community engagement, when you talk about a program like this, um, you have the support of every stakeholder along the coast, no matter what their stripes are or what hat they wear, uh, extremely excited to see that investment in their future. And so this is a, a shoe box that runs on uh, D batteries or solar cell and is uh, fairly inexpensive. So you can afford a lot more of them than they would tide gauge. And they talk to a gateway hub that's pictured here. These are uh, quite a bit more money, but you don't need very many of them because each gateway device serves uh, hundreds of sensors across a one to four mile line of sight. And obviously these need internet and power. And we've installed uh, 14 of these in a backbone across Chatham County today. Now, in terms of the accuracy of these Georgia Tech design sensors, um, they performed very, very well in a benchmark with Fort Pulaski over the last eight months or so. I'm showing just a couple title cycles from these uh, two, two sensors that we have co-installed there. And you can see that uh, you know, they're capturing all the, the peaks and troughs uh, bang on, but more importantly, uh, the level of uh, accuracy is, is about a centimeter um, off of Fort Pulaski maximum uh, at any on average at any given time. And so there are some spikes that are not shared uh, that are probably uh, maybe wave activities or, or things like that that were not resolved. But at any rate, uh, we're very happy with this comparison and and uh, have this uh, developing for publication. So the decision support tools that we've chosen to lift it up are designed by our community stakeholder needs. They are driven by those needs and conversations. So number one, everybody wants a public data portal. The data is now freely available on an API. You too can go there and click these buttons and check out the data. We'll be lifting up a research grade portal in the next month or so where you can get the entire grab bag of data with one click and some important metadata to go along as well with uncertainties. And this allows you to visualize flood levels in real time, uh, but it also allows you to uh, play with sliders for sea level rise or, or hurricanes and how they might impact uh, your, uh, your neighborhood. And then, of course, the emergency planning portal with a core stakeholder from emergency planning, um, trying to understand what they want. And they want a, uh, a overlay of critical infrastructure, of course. Uh, Donatello was talking about utilities. Uh, we started with bridges because that was the number one request from our stakeholder and layering up to include things like hospitals, roadways, utility substations, et cetera. Very excited to have that in beta form right now. And then last but not least, and most ambition is Donatello mentioned a three day forecasting system that integrates uh, from the air to the land to the ocean uh, at a 10 meter resolution. So I'll tell you where that is and, and how where it stands. And you can see many duplicate efforts underway across the country uh, as we as we really put our eyes and sights on the most complex uh, physical phenomenon that are occurring along the coast and try to understand how we could use these frameworks for decision support. So we're using the SHIFEM Coastal Ocean Modeling Grid. This is in collaboration with University of Bologna through Nadia Pinardi. And this is running uh, basically in a, in a bespoke grid that encompasses the savannah and surrounding region and is an adaptive grid that narrows down in and up into the channels and rivers and tributaries along the savannah coastline here. And so this, I'm not gonna show you these simulations because I'd probably break the webcast here, but, um, but the bottom line is that we're moving from, of course, the basin scale phenomenon that provides boundary conditions to a higher resolution model. And you can see the downstream flow of where we are developing these neighborhood level flood forecast tools and for uh, for decision support, thinking about moving from the regional model down to the right, which is integrating in an urban hydrological model, which incorporates things like drainage infrastructures as well as land surface hydrology. 
Moving down into the bottom panel here, you can see sewers and, and a full build out of the actual savanna level drainage grid uh, being incorporated there. We have a couple simulations in test mode right now for that, but that's the kind of tool that helps people understand um, what what would be their highest priority investments from a drainage infrastructure perspective as uh, simulated out over the next uh, decades of potential compound flood risks from the community. And of course, of co eventually getting down into neighborhood level flood forecasting and flood visualizations that can provide much more detailed view of flood risk. Now, we talked a little bit about socioeconomic risk and the differential uh, landscape for flood vulnerability across our coastal communities. And this is one such census, uh, census data looking at poverty rates in Savannah, which are extreme in some neighborhoods, well over 50% uh, of, of federal poverty level uh, residents there. And so the neighborhoods where we are partnering are Woodville, Bartow, and Hudson Hill Bayview is listed down here. This is where the Harambe House is located, and they work very closely with these communities to understand the full range of concerns and threats that these communities face, as well as what kind of inherent resilience they bring to the table and what kind of assets uh, they have going forward. And so it's not just a deficit based model. It's also an asset based model when you walk in and start to understand what resilience means to these people and how you can build it in partnership through time. And so with this, we have a very exciting uh, collaboration with Yanni Lukisis, who's a social scientist at Georgia Tech, and he has developed this map room technology that allows local residents, as pictured here, to come in and interact with a visualization of their neighborhood with markers that can incorporate their local knowledge of things like assets and resilience and threats into a spatial framework for data collection, frankly, that we can use to understand the full landscape of coastal resilience and, and coastal threats for these localized neighborhoods um, of low income residents. So everybody loves doing this. My 11 year old loves doing this. Um, it's very, very fun and it creates a permanent artifact uh, for the community to return to. We also have a middle school curriculum we developed. I'm wrapping up here. Uh, middle school curriculum for uh, sixth grade earth science in Georgia, which is standard base, uh, developed by uh, Dr. Alex Robel, who's a sea level rise and glacier glaciologist expert and education scientist. You can download this freely on Sakura.org. And last but not least, just to wrap up some key lessons, um, I, what I'm illustrating here for you is a framework that is transdisciplinary in nature in terms of the research, um, research construction, the research design. I didn't even know that this word existed until about six months ago. So what does this tell us? That tells us that the training that we need to be deploying in coastal resilience work is something that we've had to add on to our core expertise. And we really need to do this. Uh, we need to reflect this better in our pedagogy. We need to reflect this better in research opportunities. And, and evolve these uh, concepts a lot more quickly across our science. Stakeholders' um, priorities have been our guide and they've developed uh, into some very high impactful work in the, in the coast there. Funding is a big challenge. I hope that's not going to be the case for the next four years, we will see, but uh, looking to diversify beyond federal resources has been extremely important for us. And then this last point about centering climate justice, I think is something that we can all uh, take away from the renewed interest in racial justice and equity across this nation and beyond and inform some of the ways in which we can develop uh, meaningful and lasting solutions for the most vulnerable coastal communities. But again, um, this is something that is not baked in necessarily so, and it would be great to see a renewed focus on this across those communities that are um, working in this space. Thank you very much. Thank you Thank very you. much, Kim. Um, so uh, I see there is already uh, a couple of questions for Kim in the chat. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll kindly ask you to please, uh, if you can reply in the chat so that we can move on to the next talk. And then if we have a little bit of time at the end, we can uh, come back and bring them on in the discussions. So uh, moving on uh, to our final speaker uh, for today's webinar uh, is uh, Chris Paikush, who is with the Woods Hole uh, Oceanographic Institution. And uh, he's going to talk about the drivers of U.S. East Coast sea level variability from years to decades in a changing ocean. What do we know and what do we need to know? Chris? All your
Great. Thank you very much, Rick. All right, I'll do what every speaker does and just make sure that everyone can see my screen and hear me well. Is that okay? Yes, all good. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, I'd like to reiterate what the four speakers uh, preceding me have said. I'd really like to thank Ricardo and Jenny and U.S. Clivar for giving me the opportunity to write this piece. I'd uh, also like to say how honored I am to share the stage with the four preceding speakers who are doing uh, such impressive work, uh, such impressive transdisciplinary work. Uh, I feel a little bit boring uh, in comparison. So this, this talk um, doesn't sort of go into transdisciplinary research. I was tasked with covering more of the physical science basis, talking about what are the drivers of observed changes in U.S. East Coast sea level variability, and particularly changes that occur on interannual, so that is yearly to decadal timescale. So we're not looking at these short-term changes due to things like tides and storms. We're not also looking at the longer term change that we usually think of uh, in terms of sea level rise, we're looking at this kind of liminal space, if you will, of, of the decadal to interannual scale. Uh, just to set the stage, uh, Obe showed a, a similar plot when he started his talk, uh, and I think it's worth reiterating um, how complex the sea level process is. I like to say that sea level change is a whole earth process. Uh, I'm showing a figure here that's taken from a recent uh, intergovernmental panel on climate change report. Um, this cartoon is meant to indicate the various processes that occur uh, in the Earth system that can influence global or regional sea level, um, depending on the time scale and the spatial scale. Uh, you'll see a few things at work. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on this slide because it's introductory, but just to point out a few things, we see things like ocean dynamics, changes in currents, changes in winds that can redistribute uh, ocean volume and change sea levels locally and regionally. Of course, we know about the melting of, of land ice, mountain glaciers and ice sheets and how those add mass to the global ocean, raising sea levels uh, uh, globally. Uh, but also as, as Obe indicated, uh, when you melt an ice sheet, you also perturb Earth's gravitational field, its rotation vector and deform the crust. So you also cause regional patterns of, of sea level change. Um, again, I could spend a lot of time uh, on this plot, but what I'm hoping to communicate here simply is that uh, it's complicated. Sea level change is a very complicated process and having a good understanding of why sea level has changed in the past and will change in the future uh, requires a pretty comprehensive knowledge uh, of the Earth system. So that's just introduction. Uh, in, terms of, in terms of my talk, in terms of my paper that I was tasked with writing, uh, part of what I'll describe today is, a, is retrospective. I'll look at literature published in the past decade that describes what we know about sea level change on the East Coast. But another part of my talk and another part of my paper is also forward looking, trying to identify challenges, opportunities, and questions for the future. So those two sections will be covered. And I'll try to be keep within 10 minutes here. Uh, so first, the retrospective part. Um, hinted to in my title, what do we know about the drivers, the physical drivers of US East Coast sea level variability, particularly things that we've learned over the past decade or so? Well, as indicated um, by my previous slide, there are, there are a lot of potential drivers here, a lot of potential processes that are operative in the Earth system that can potentially uh, lead to sea level change on the East Coast. And the literature over the past decade, um, which I'm kind of indicating with all these references, sorry, it's a bit busy, and hopefully there's no one in the room whose paper I, I missed. <laughs> um, the, the literature over the past decade really has focused on three classes of processes that are thought to be important uh, in causing sea level change along the coast. Uh, one is the large scale ocean circulation. So there've been a lot of studies that have looked at how sea level changes observed at the coast, say by things like maybe the sea level sensors that Kim just described or, or tide gauges that NOAA operates, how those changes at the coast are, are coupled or otherwise related to larger scale changes in the ocean circulation, particularly currents like the Florida current or the Gulf Stream or, or this, this bigger notion of the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation. You might have heard this called uh, the Great Conveyor Belt. Again, the question here is how is what's happening at the coast related to the bigger picture? That's one class. Uh, another class of study focuses more locally at the coast, specifically looking at local uh, meteorological changes, how things like changes in the winds along the shore, changes in surface barometric pressure, and things like changes in riverine outflow can all influence sea level at the coast. 
And a final class of studies that, um, of which there are fewer uh, looks at the redistribution of, of ice and water. I hinted a moment ago that when ice melts from an ice sheet, that water isn't distributed evenly over the ocean's uh, surface, but rather uh, it leads to higher rates in some places compared to others due to changes in rotation and gravity and solid deformation. I'll just touch on a couple of these really, really quickly in the interest of time. Uh, one, we're going to look at th this first topic of the relationship between sea level uh, and the large scale circulation. I'm sure figures here um, from two different studies. One is from one of Ricardo's earlier studies that's on the on the left panel and, and a similar plot on the right from a paper by Jan Zhao and, and Bill Johns a few years ago. Um, both of these figures are showing uh, the, essentially the same physical quantity, but focusing on, on different different time scales. One on more the, the annual or seasonal time scale, one on the interannual to decadal time scale. And what both of these panels are showing, it, it's the correlation coefficient, how correlated uh, sea level is over the whole ocean. So all, so all the color indicates uh, measurements of sea level from satellite altimetry. Uh, and each of these correlation coefficients, red or positive values, blue negative values, is how related sea level is at that point uh, to changes in the Florida current. So if you look at the left panel on the bottom left, there's a green bar going from about West Palm Beach to Grand Bahama Island. That indicates long-term measurements of the Florida current, which is essentially the Gulf Stream at its, at its inception in Florida Straits. And we see some very interesting patterns. Uh, specifically, you see these deep blue colors uh, along the, the US East Coast going uh, on the left panel the entire way up the coast and in the right panel concentrated around the Florida coast. So this indicates that when there's a, uh, an increase in the current transport, we see a decrease in sea level, vice versa. If the current slows down, you see an increase in sea level at the coast. Uh, but you also see uh, deep reds indicating a, a positive correlation around Grand Bahama Island, meaning, meaning that there's an in-phase relationship. That is when, when the transport increases, sea level goes up. And when transport decreases, uh, sea level goes down. Uh, and these kinds of relationships, uh, although borne out by observations here, are expected from simple ocean physics, namely geostrophic balance, which uh, basically says that the, the, the strength of the current uh, is going to be related to the tilt of sea level across, across the straits. So this is one, again, the, the point here is that I'm showing that there's a, there could be a tight relationship between what sea level does, uh, even at the coast, and the behavior of large scale ocean currents. Uh, another topic I mentioned was the redistribution of, of surface water and ice mass. Here's a figure from a paper by Thomas Fredrickson a few years ago. And what he's quantifying here, he and his colleagues, they're, they're quantifying the contribution of, of different ice melt and water sources to land level and sea level change along the northeast coast. This is from Cape Hatteras up to about Cape Cod. Uh, if we look at the panel on the right, this panel B, uh, the different colors uh, are the different contributions from different water and ice sources indicated in the legend to the top left. Uh, and the orange is the sum of all these contributions. And what you see is that from about the mid 1960s to the mid 2010s is that melting of ice and redistri redistribution of water contributed about uh, four and a half centimeters uh, of sea level rise uh, along the East Coast. So this represents about one quarter of the total rise observed by tide gauges and about one third of the acceleration. If you look at that orange curve, you can see that there's a distinct quadratic uh, nature to it indicating an acceleration. So this, again, this paper is one of the few that explicitly quantifies how important ice and water mass redistribution is to past changes. Um, that was a that was a bit of a quick flyby. Again, in the interest of, of time, uh, if you, if you're interested, I encourage you to sort of uh, look at the paper I wrote and maybe consult consult those references. But I think, in the interest of being forward looking, I think it's really interesting to to to, to look at what's been learned over the past decade and and look at opportunities uh, for the future. And in my, and in my paper, I identify uh, six such opportunities. I'm sure a different author would identify maybe more or less or different ones, but this is my sort of subjective uh, take. And I'll I'll, I'll walk through these. Um, uh, I'll walk through these and then depending on time, I'll, I'll spend a little bit more time discussing them. So what do we need to know about the future? Um, first is the question is how did US East Coast sea level vary during earlier time periods? What am I talking about? Well, a lot of the knowledge that I just uh, mentioned that's been gathered over the past uh, decade or so is based on tidal gauge records. So these are gauges that are, that are operated by NOAA uh, and in places that have been operating for decades. Um, most of those gauges, those records, the data only goes back to about mid last century, so around 1950. And the period from 1950 to the present, that's 70 years, is, is really a short period uh, in the context of Earth's longer his, uh, climate history. Uh, so the question is, 
do the data we have from these tide gauges, are, are they representative of, of the more general behavior? And so uh, one opportunity for future research is, is to look further back in the record. We have coming online new data sources that allow us to probe deeper into the past. One is the recovery of our archival tidal gauge data from, from deeper back in the past uh, that, is, that is being uh, in the process of being digitized. Another is new proxy methods, um, the, the, the devising of, of new inferences based on either salt marsh sediments or coral micro atolls, uh, mangrove peats, things like this that allow us to uh, look at sea level variability on interannual to decadal timescales in some cases, uh, centuries back into the past. So that's one, uh, one, one direction. Another is, uh, my second bullet point here is, what is the spectrum of vertical land motion along the East Coast? Let me, let me unpack that. We know that um, it, it's been implied in all of the talks that we've heard today, um, this, this notion of sea level involves two components. One is the height of the sea surface itself. Uh, but the other is the height of, of the of the land surface uh, relative to that sea surface. So we care not only oh goodness one minute I've got I've got to speed up. Um, <laughs> uh, we want it, we're interested not only in the sea surface height changes um, but also changes in the vertical land motion. Now uh, we know much less about this land motion part than we do about the sea surface height part. Um, we also have new technologies coming online that offer a lot of promise here. One is is continuous GPS monitoring. Um, there are some long GPS stations measuring land motion uh, going back about 25 years along parts of the coast, but also new satellite technologies. For instance, uh, uh, interferometric synthetic torture radar um, shows promise of, of mapping uh, land motion down on, on what I'd call the neighborhood level, looking at sort of tens of meters to, to kilometers. Um, again, I apologize for, for taking a little bit uh, too long here, um, but you can read for yourself um, these other questions. Um, yeah, I'm just going to skip to the end here and, and just take some questions. So I'm going to skip over these examples I had. Again, apologies um, for the time here. I just want to uh, hope you take away a couple points here. One is that I've tried to emphasize that sea the whole Earth process and that having an understanding of sea level change requires a comprehensive knowledge of the Earth system. Uh, I've, I've in the paper and very briefly here reviewed how recent studies expand our knowledge about how large scale circulation, uh, local forcing mechanisms and redistribution of ice and water mass contribute to observe sea level change. And finally, there are new technologies and observational platforms, um, along with pressing changes in the ocean, which again, I apologize for, for not managing time well on this talk. Uh, I didn't get to discuss them too much. Uh, but these things collectively present a whole new set of challenges and opportunities in terms of questions for the future. Uh, and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you, Chris. There's one question from Obi in the chat already. Uh, what is generally accepted ex explanation for rapid rise in sea level in the southeast coastline? Yeah, good question. I'm, 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 there's a few things. I mean, it, it depends on your time scale, uh, but but some of those same mechanisms that I talked about come into play, um, and some of which uh, Ricardo has written about. So he's 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 free to sort of chime in here if, if I if I miss some of the things. Um, one is the melting of of land ice, particularly of of, of Greenland. Um, uh, the melting of the Greenland ice sheet and the gravitational signature of that change has been a, a large contributor to the observed acceleration in sea level rise since about the, the 1990s. So, so people like Jim Davis and Nadia Vinogradova have, have, have written about that process. Uh, but there's also been um, much more prominent recent changes since about 2010 um, that are related to changes in ocean circulation and ocean climate. For example, Ricardo has written a very nice paper about how uh, warming of, of the Gulf Stream uh, between 2010 and 2015. Uh, so when you when you warm ocean water, of course, it extremely raising and that effect that that warming and expansion of seawater um, in the Florida Straits and along the South Atlantic Bight was responsible for a, a large acceleration uh, in, in sea level along the southeast coast uh, in, in recent years. So those are a couple of processes, uh, both related to ocean circulation and climate and melting land ice that, again, depending on the time scale you're interested in, whether it's interannual or decadal or longer, can be very important contributors to um, uh, accelerations in sea level rise along the southeast coast. And Rick, again, you should omitted any important points on that since I know you're the expert there. Well, that's exactly uh, what we found. And uh, as a matter of fact, the the uh, the paper only covered uh, until 2015, but it, it's actually we from recent data suggest that we continue to see that positive phase of the warming. So. Uh, so uh, we have uh, about two minutes left, and uh, before uh, we move on, let me see if there are any other questions. So 
So Donatella is, is asking, what is the time resolution of your forecast yearly? Is that to me or to someone else? To you, um, Sorry, I'm, yes, uh, maybe, maybe I'm misunderstanding. So, so there aren't any forecasts uh, in, in what I presented. Yeah, in your, um, uh, in your prediction. So most of what I was looking at was looking at the past changes, and these are based on time gauges. Uh, okay. but, but again, um, again, there are, there are lots of time scales that, that, that are, of course, of interest. Mm -hmm. um, and the particular um, tasking from, from Ricardo and others was to look at these changes in this intermediate time scale of, of, of uh, years to decades. So all the processes that I talked about, if one is interested in taking a step forward and predicting, yeah. these are things that one would want to take into account, um, uh, again, on the yearly to decadal time scale. And it, it, it's an important question. I mean, the question is, of those processes I discussed, you know, which one of them, if any, confer any sense of predictability? Um, it, it's, a, yeah. it's a challenge. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, before uh, we close, I just wanted to give uh, Kim an opportunity if, if she has, I, I saw she already replied to some of the questions in the chat, but if you wanted to say uh, a word or two or not. Oh, I'm okay. I, I'm just uh, happy to, to interact in the chat with those folks and to note that we are interested in deploying some sensors, uh, limited in number perhaps, to other sites as a research uh, exercise. So please keep that in mind. And the, and the modeling, really, we hope to take operational in the next year, but it needs a lot of work. Those are the bottom lines. I would like, if there is time, I would like to add uh, something to what Kim presented. So she talked about uh, uh, this uh, multi sector, okay, and the different, uh, the need to integrate different stakeholders and uh, university and academy. But, um, one of the big challenges I'm pretty sure that Kim is aware of uh, is, uh, you know, we all speak a different language. And, uh, you know, how you is not only modeling, uh, you know, put or integrate models, it's also integrate the needs of different, uh, different needs uh, of different stakeholders uh, here yeah, to present, uh, for example, uh, you know, uh, uncertainty and all the results of this integrated uh, uh, modeling. So that is a huge challenge. Thank you very much, Donatella. Actually, uh, that's one of the things that we've learned uh, also last year during our workshop. Uh, it's it's a it's very challenging um, making uh, bridging this gap, but it's it's also a very much needed uh, connection that we need to work on in the future. And so, with that, I'll I'll just make a few closing remarks. Uh, uh, as you all seen, uh, this special issue allowed us to very neatly illustrate some of these. Uh, state of the art uh, work that is ongoing, uh, not only with the science of sea level rise, but also in terms of you know, observing technologies and uh, some of the factors that are being considered uh, in decision making and to mitigate uh, the impacts of sea level rise. And that, as, as I said, uh, as I just uh, pointed, uh, is that one of the main challenges is that uh, this exchange of information, uh, which is inherently multidisciplinary, uh, is uh, one of the main needs, and, and this will become increasingly more important in the future uh, as the impacts of sea level rise amplify. So with that said, I wanted to thank you all very much, and um, I'm looking forward to uh, working with you in the future and also uh, learning uh, about your uh, very exciting work. Uh, more. Thank you very much. Yes, and I'd like to re uh, reiterate what Ricardo said. So thank you, Obe, Jake, Donatella, Kim, and Chris for presenting at today's webinar and for contributing the articles at this uh, variations edition on U.S. East Coast sea level changes and impacts. And a big thank you to Ricardo for leading the organization of this edition and helping me moderate the webinar. So as I said, a recording will be available later this week, and I'll make an announcement when that's available. So thank you, everyone, for participating. <laughs>